Greetings from the Cosmos Foundation. This is Nahar Khan, and it gives me much pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar under our Ambassador Lecture Series on Bangladesh-Indonesia Relations, Prognosis for the Future. Today's discussion on relations between Bangladesh and Indonesia, two nations who share a deep and tested history of friendship, will be chaired by Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chodhury, President of Cosmos Foundation, followed by the keynote by His Excellency Hiro Sabolo, Ambassador of Indonesia to Bangladesh. Subsequently, we will be joined by three distinguished discussants today, Dr. Lala Furyasmin, Professor, Department of International Relations at Taka University, Ambassador Tariq Karim, Honorary Advisor Emeritus of Cosmos Foundation, and Mr. Shayan Khan, Executive Director of Taka Courier. Indonesia has remained one of Bangladesh's most trusted friends with 50 years of diplomatic ties. Official diplomatic relations were established in 1972 after Indonesia became one of the first Muslim countries to recognize Bangladesh as a sovereign state. The two countries have a history of cooperation at several levels in the United Nations and various multilateral organizations particularly in international peacekeeping, the group of D8 countries, the non-aligned movement, the World Trade Organization, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. The two nations which belong to the Indian Ocean Rim Association are becoming important trade partners. Both countries have enjoyed healthy economic growth in recent years, thanks to economic reforms, stimulus packages, and investments in infrastructure projects. As the largest economy of Southeast Asia and the second largest economy in South Asia, respectively, Indonesia and Bangladesh now enjoy natural opportunities to expand their economic engagement with each other. Bangladesh is pursuing the next level of growth as it emerges out of the group of LDC nations through diversification of products in its export basket. And Indonesia, as the world's 16th largest economy, should be a natural destination for a large portion of that. During Indonesian President Joko Widodo's visit to Bangladesh in 2018, the two countries took up five wide-ranging agreements. They covered foreign office consultations, cooperation to combat illegal fishing, cooperation in the energy and power sectors, and launching negotiations to sign a PTA. President Widodo also took the time during that trip to visit the Rohingya refugee camps in the south of the country. We hope Indonesia can use its important standing with the group of ASEAN nations to pressure Myanmar into repatriating the Rohingya people at the earliest in a safe and voluntary manner. The signing of the PTA, which still remains under negotiation, would be an effective tool for further strengthening the trade and economic relations between the two countries. I am pleased to note that as recently as November 2021, the foreign ministers of the two countries reiterated their commitment to an early conclusion of the negotiations to sign a PTA that is both inclusive and mutually beneficial. That meeting was held on the sidelines of the Indian Ocean Rim Association an important multilateral forum where the two countries cooperate extensively. Previously in 2019, the Indonesia Bangladesh Business and Investment Forum was held in Taka, where the businessmen in attendance from both countries pledged a target to increase bilateral trade to 10 billion US dollars in 2029. The pandemic came to slow down our progress towards that target, but as two countries that have weathered the storm fairly well, Hopefully this progress can resume very soon if it hasn't already. With that, I shall hand it over to our chair, Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhary, president of Cosmos Foundation and our former foreign affairs advisor, and very much look forward to hearing from the highly distinguished panel we have gathered here today to enlighten us on the way forward. Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nahar. Uh, for me, of course, it's an enormous delight to be able to chair this webinar. Uh, webinar with regard to Bangladesh's relations with such a distinguished friend of our country, I mean, Indonesia. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that country, Indonesia, being represented in Bangladesh 
by Ambassador Subolo, whom I had the privilege to meet recently and thereafter correspond. And these have been very stimulating uh, exchanges. Now, he's going to, he's, of course, as you have said, Nahar is the keynote speaker today. I should also wish to recognize and commend this extremely high uh, quality level of uh, discussions that we have. And I look forward to what is bound to be a um, stimulating uh, exchange of ideas. Now, from my perch in Singapore, uh, I have been able, uh, I've been able to watch Indonesia uh, from a fairly close proximity. Uh, it is the largest uh, Muslim majority nation and a key member of the developing eight or D8 uh, grouping, as it is called. It's also currently chairing the G20 and, and, and office it is conducting with skill and dexterity. I've long admired Indonesia's uh, free and active foreign policy and its leadership role in the ASEAN uh, as Asia Pacific's largest economy. Uh, Indonesia acts in this region in consonance with its size and location, but avoiding involvement in big power conflicts or rivalries. Uh, this is worthy of emulation for <coughs> countries of comparable milieu. Our ties, the ties between Bengali people and, and, and Indonesians, go deep into history to the 9th century when the Sri Vijaya Empire in the archipelago had links with Buddhist, then Buddhist Bengal. Uh, with the spread of Islam in both regions, maritime links between medieval Bengal, Sultanate, and the kingdoms of uh, the Nusantara uh, continued. The strong trading and uh, cultural uh, connections Small wonder, therefore, that bilateral relations got off to such a splendid start immediately after Bangladesh's independence. This month, we celebrate 50 years, 50 years of our bilateral relations and, and rejoice in our friendship and collaboration across a wide spectrum of, of such as uh, commerce, politics, defense and culture. I should be remiss where I also not to mention Indonesia's strong support to the Rohingya issue, both uh, bilaterally and in various multilateral fora. For me, it has been a learning experience to have worked with uh, stellar and legendary uh, Indonesian uh, diplomats like for Foreign Minister uh, Ali Alatas and also my friend Hassan Virajuda. We were together in Geneva and then uh, uh, when, uh, thereafter as well for years. And these have, you know, these kind of interactions have been at individual levels between, between uh, uh, our diplomats and, and uh, uh, their Indonesian counterparts have sort of fed into the process of the strengthening of the bilateral relations, uh, bilateral ties between our two countries. But I would leave uh, the more detailed uh, uh, description of the relationship to uh, our keynote speaker and our distinguished panelists. And with these few words, I should like to invite Ambassador Subolo to the microphone. Ambassador, you have the next 30 minutes or so, and thereafter I will invite the discussants uh, in the order that they have been named in the program. So Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iftikar Ahmad Kauduri. Uh, very uh, good morning to see you again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Allow me also to greet uh, Ms. Nahar Khan, which already uh, provide a welcoming uh, remark a little bit on this very timely discussion. And also our distinguished panelists, Ambassador Tariq Karim, Professor Lelu Yasmin, and Mr. Sayan Khan. Uh, Excellency, colleague and friends, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank profoundly to Cosmos Foundation for inviting me to share some points on Indonesia-Bangladesh relation. And topic today is very timely, Bangladesh-Indonesia prognosis for the future. 
But before that, uh, I learned that this situation in which uh, climate change uncertainty allow me also to send warm sympathy to my fellow Bangladeshi, especially who lives in Silhet area, affected by recent flood and rain in very uh, disastrous time. Our sincere sympathy also goes to all businesses and households that lost property or suffered destruction. I pray to Almighty to impart those who are affected with all strength to come out of this tough time. Uh, this year is also a very special year for Bangladesh. On the 50th anniversary of the independence of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, as well as the centennial birth anniversary of the father of nation, Banga Bandu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. On behalf of the Indonesian people in Bangladesh and the Embassy of Indonesia, would like to offer its heartfelt congratulations on this remarkable celebration. Let me begin this part from the historical background. Our recorded history of more than 1,000 years tells us that our people have always maintained contact with each other. Contact between the Bay of Bengal region and Indonesian archipelago dates back to centuries ago. Indonesia and Bangladesh were connected by the maritime Silk Road of the Indian Ocean Trade Network, where the passage of goods and knowledge was exchanged. Since the early 4th century, Indonesia has accepted Hinduism and later Buddhism from the Indian subcontinent. In the 9th century of Srivijaya Empire, established contact through religious and educational link with Buddhist schools, monasteries, and universities in ancient India and Bangladesh, such as in Nalanda and in Somapura. We learned that after the separation of Bangladesh from Pakistan, Indonesia, together with other countries, immediately recognized Bangladesh sovereignty in 1971. Furthermore, after the independence in 1971, Bangladesh immediately established diplomatic relation with Indonesia and the embassy began functioning since May 1972. Indonesia was one of the first country that gave official recognition of Bangladesh independence, which was in 1972. Bilateral relationship between our two great nations Beyond its 50 years dynamic and solid modern day connectivity signified by our great assets. Indonesia and Bangladesh have great assets in forging close and friendly bilateral relations. Let's take a look on the population, population wise. Indonesia is the fourth biggest population in the world after India, China, and the US. While Bangladesh is the position as the number eight biggest population in the world. Both countries share a large number of Muslim populations in the world, in which Indonesia contributes 12.6% of total Muslims, while Bangladesh contributes 9.2% of total Muslim in the world. Take a look at an international contact, which are already also been touched by uh, ambassadors uh, Koduri. Indonesia and Bangladesh are fellow members and share many similar interests in the United Nations, ASEAN African Conference, Non Aligned Movement, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Developing Aid, Group of 77, Indian Ocean Rim Initiative, IORA, the ASEAN Regional Forum and also the member of Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or IC, as well. Our UN peacekeeping operations are in many parts in the world. Indonesia position number seven, with 3,000 Indonesian peacekeepers, while Bangladesh is position number one in the world, with total 6,500 Bangladeshi peacekeepers. We support also, if effort by Bangladesh in Rohingya issues through regional 
as well as bilateral matters. We have shared common viewpoint in various regional and in multilateral fora. Let's also take a look in the cultural context. Indonesia and Bangladesh also share historical, religious, and language similarities. Both Indonesia and Bangladesh language are rooted from Sanskrit. Hence, several words and vocabulary in Bahasa Indonesia or in Indonesian language has similar meaning with some word in Bengali. For example, dunia is dunia, matahari or surya, bahasa, bahasa, uh, etc. Surely, this is a solid asset of bilateral relations. However, we need a glue to bind us stronger. My view is people-to-people -people contact must be strengthened by enhancing more cooperation, for example, in education, including capacity building sectors, cultural connection, health, etc. To do so, the strengthening of Indonesia diaspora in Bangladesh and Bengali diaspora in Indonesia and all over the world, indeed a mission to do. So we have to elevate to a new perspective and modern chapter on this. How about the status of G2G at play? Strengthening G2G partnership is very important. In April last year, Indonesia and Bangladesh concluded their first foreign office consultation covering wide range of issues of cooperation, such as defense, trade and economy, security, and social culture. Our second FOC meeting, which Indonesia would be the host this year, will solidify the achievement as well as addressing common concern and also to seize the momentum beyond 50 years anniversary. So far, Bangladesh and Indonesia have continuously collaborated in the defense, defense and military field in the form of student exchanges in Defense Services Command and staff college, and also at the National Defense College. Besides being active in student exchange cooperation, Indonesia and Bangladesh have also carried out activities in the form of visit by military officials, defense, as well as cooperation in counterterrorism. MOU on, the, on this field is also underway to complete very soon. Indonesia and Bangladesh bilateral trade is also fast and robust. Recent effort to boost cooperation in trade between the two countries shows significant progress in various sectors. The volume of bilateral trade jumped sharply, up to 72% from US dollar 1.76 billion in 2020 to 3.03 billion in 2021. This achievement obviously shows that bilateral trade activities remain strong amid the pandemic. So it is very interesting to learn that our trade not only focus on traditional commodities, but also covers broad and strategic product too. Traditionally, our major export to Bangladesh are palm oil and its derivative products, coal, chemical, wood pulp, yarn, uh, food, artificial staple, copra, spices, etc. On the other hand, Bangladesh's major export to Indonesia are mostly ready-made garments, knit, jute yarn, packing bag, etc. But now, our strategic industry product already entered Bangladesh market. Indonesia state-owned company which produces train wagon has contributed to modernize the land transportation in Bangladesh since 2006, and also ready to embark more with better and modern train wagon for long, medium, as well as light trains. Furthermore, from 2019 to 2021, also one of Indonesia bus assembling company has exported four luxury buses and 10 double-decker buses to Bangladesh. Along with that, 
our aircraft industry has also liked to participate in strengthening connectivity between regions, as well as for military purposes in Bangladesh. In addition, Bangladesh Army in the past has also used product from the Indonesian defense industry. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh is also a potential market for Indonesia strategic and leading industry. With stable economic growth and a favorable investment climate in Bangladesh, the prospect of trade and investment are open wider. With a combined Indonesia-Bangladesh market of more than 400 million consumers, there are still ample of opportunities in economic sectors to explore and to expand the bilateral trade that currently exceed 3 billion US dollars. Investment in energy sector in Bangladesh is also promising. Currently, progress is being pursued by Indonesian state-owned company, PT Pertamina, and its Bangladesh counterpart and other parties to build an integrated power generating plant in Bangladesh. It is also the great interest that PT Pertamina is looking closely in other areas, such as prospective oil exploration, as well as power distribution in this country. A number of MOUs are being pursued. New or extension MOU, including among others, MOU on energy that was expired in the end of 2020 is now being pursued to extend. We noted that boasting of a 90 million internet users, according to Internet World State 2019, and the fifth largest internet users population in the Asia Pacific and over 180 million mobile subscriber and a robust national digital identity system, Bangladesh boasts a successful digital ecosystem and can improve access to global market. This will surely expand digital trade that enable Digital Bangladesh 2.0 to succeed. Parallel to this, Indonesia's industry can support this development to transform Bangladesh Indonesia digital trade into a new high. Currently, both countries are working to finalize the Indonesia Bangladesh Preferential Trade Agreement or IBPTA to cover more products and for facilitating, facilitating more trade interaction between two countries. The completion of IBPTA will give significant impact to increase bilateral trade transactions. So let us discuss a little bit on how we should move forward. Bangladesh and Indonesia need to be prosper together. We have already embarked in many different regional and international fora. IORA, D8, ARF, OIC, and UN. As such, Bangladesh and Indonesia essentially need to see themselves as a comprehensive friends and partners. This friendship and partnership become more important amid dynamic and uncertainties stemming from Russia's war in Ukraine, post-pandemic recovery, and also seemingly inflation that cripple many countries, and also intolerant and radicalization issues, etc. Impact and consequences are felt any part of the world. Bangladesh and Indonesia are in better position in tackling those challenges together. In view of this, we wish to suggest a broader action plan that incorporating the best of our each national capacities to make up for the gap needed 
to strengthen the genuine partnership between two countries. The other dimension that I would like also to underline that our people should be known each other better so that the increasing continue people to people interaction or connection that will lead to a mutual understanding of both great potential countries between Bangladesh and Indonesia into a new height is very important. Strengthening engagement between our diaspora can be a key to achieve this goal through different kinds of cultural, sport, and tourism activities. This may be one of the alternatives that we can pursue together. As we celebrate 50 years of Bangladesh-Indonesia bilateral relations this year, it provides us the opportunity to strengthen the economic partnership, deepen bilateral trade, and digital economic environment, invest in energy power generation and distribution, as well as enhance people-to-people -people connect to power or our prosperous future together. I stop my remark today with we all a very prospective bilateral relation and all the best for better relation of Indonesia and Bangladesh. Thank you, Donabat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ambassador, for those very comprehensive uh, remarks. You have covered the entire spectrum of, of our relationship. Um, you have made some excellent suggestions with regard to, to the need, as you have said, to prosper together. Uh, both our countries to prosper together. You have suggested the action plan that would incorporate the best uh, uh, capacities of, of both countries, uh, which would also strengthen the people-to-people -people connection, which are uh, connections which are so important. And hopefully, uh, a very important step in this 50th year of our bilateral relationship would be the preferential trading agreement to which I'm sure further references will be made down the line in our discussions today. So what I'll do, Ambassador, is um, I'm going to give the discussions their uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, and so forth, uh, beginning with uh, Professor Lalapur Yasmin. And thereafter, after Ambassador uh, 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 Tarek Karim and Mr. Shayan Khan have spoken, I will revert to you again, Ambassador, for any uh, uh, thoughts on their remarks or anything else that you might wish to add after which uh, Ms. Nahar Khan will close the discussions formally and Ms. Nahar Khan will, will give the concluding remarks. So it is now pleasure, my pleasure to give the floor to uh, 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 Professor Yasmin. I shan't go into the bio details because these are uh, given and provided in the program. So, Professor Yasmin, the floor is yours. Ten minutes, Pat. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Itaka Ahmed Chaudhary. Thank you, His Excellency Subalu. It was very, it was a pleasure meeting you in person a couple of times. Uh, so, um, this is a very interesting topic that we are going to discuss today, and I thank Cosmos Foundation for arranging this uh, because uh, Bangladesh, at, uh, as it's celebrating its 50th anniversary, uh, it needs to pay a uh, uh, minute sort of uh, attention to each of the relationship and from where we can benefit, where we can advance. Bangladesh-Indonesia relations uh, is one of those areas. So in today's uh, sort of uh, my deliberation, I have um, uh, divided it in a couple of points. For example, what are the foreign policy goals and objectives of respective countries? What are the trends in current and foreign policy relations, what are the commonalities and points of convergence between Indonesia and Bangladesh, and last but uh, not the least, uh, what are the areas that we can advance our uh, bilateral relationships uh, relationship to, uh, uh, to the next level. 
So first, uh, as we, as uh, His Excellency has very poignantly pointed out that uh, there are a number of areas where Bangladesh and Indonesia's foreign policy objectives and goals converge. Uh, one of them would be that we both, both the nations uh, pursue a pacific foreign policy based on five principles of coexistence. It is very much uh, apparent to us that uh, in this world, in today's world, the way strategic relations are unfolding, um, uh, it is a uh, uh, leave and let leave and neither can survive while the other uh, goes down. So this is something we have to remember first and foremost is uh, in the foreign policy principle of both the countries that we live together, we uh, prosper together, we connect together, we develop together. And this is based on a, a sort of an idea that was proposed back in uh, late 1980s after the development of, uh, you know, after the idea of sustainable development. Uh, scholars have started talking about sustainable co-development. That is, my development cannot uh, sustain if my neighbor and a uh, greater region they do not develop together so the fruits of development must be you know spread among neighbors among you know beyond the neighborhood and indonesia is very much close to us although geographically we may look uh, being separated by uh, indian ocean and some uh, you know and it's a, a sub systems, but at the same time, how we live close together. So what are the trends in bilateral relations? We can see that how, uh, as pointed out before, has how Indonesia has taken up the issue of uh, uh, Rohingya, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, with Myanmar uh, on the Rohingya issue. And we can see that how Indonesia has taken a proactive role, bringing it to ASEAN, point, uh, you know, in the formulation of five point agreements. Uh, although there are a number of challenges uh, in this area, we understand. And therefore, um, we know that this issue might take a little time to uh, uh, resolve fully. But we uh, applaud and we encourage Indonesia's continuous proactive role in this, connect, in this issue. And here, if I can mention former foreign minister, of Indonesia, Marty Natalegoa. Uh, he pointed out how in, it is time for Indonesia to step up and take a, a more proactive uh, role um, in uh, pursuing, uh, promoting Indonesia in the global affairs. So here we can see that Indonesia is using IOARA forum, how Indonesia is taking up this proactive role and for Bangladesh, uh, as we can see Bangladesh uh, being at the, at the cusp of changes and its, its global status at, is at the transformational level how Bangladesh is also gradually should take up uh, a proactive role in the matters that relate to its fundamental existence, its fundamental foreign policy goals and objectives. So what are the commonalities and points of convergence? As has been uh, already been told, Bangladesh and Indonesia together are members of WTO, OIC, Developing Aid, IORA, NAM, uh, ASEAN uh, Regional Forum, G77. Uh, so Bangladesh and Indonesia together, they represent a good number of an participate in a good number of uh, organizations that belong to Global South. So Bangladesh and Indonesia both can represent a Global South Southern voice, uh, a voice where, uh, you know, Bangladesh is already being uh, termed as emerging middle power. Indonesia is already there as a middle power. How we can work together in this respective, re in this respective areas to promote our foreign policy goals and objectives. Then we can see the Indo-Pacific region. Indonesia is a key player in Indo-Pacific region and in Indonesia plays a role of balancer in this region. Indonesia plays a neutral role in China and American uh, uh, confrontation, rivalry, cooperation, however we call it. So in, uh, in the Pacific region, how Indonesia plays a neutral role. Bangladesh uh, as a gatekeeper in the Bay of Bengal region also plays such a role um, in this region. Then also we can see that how both Bangladesh and Indonesia act as strong voice at different multilateral forums. So here we can find a number of points of convergence uh, that act between Bangladesh and uh, Indonesia. Uh, in terms of bilateral, uh, uh, direct bilateral relations, we know that uh, Bangladesh and Indonesia are set to uh, sign a preferential trade agreement, uh, preferably by this uh, by uh, 2022. And here we can see a number of uh, you know products where Indonesia. Uh, exposed to Bangladesh and Bangladesh export to um, uh, exports to Indonesia. For example, animal and uh, vegetable byproducts. Um, uh, then there are mineral products and textile. And from Bangladesh, there goes textile, foodstuffs, chemical products. And Bangladesh is eyeing for uh, the emerging uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, mar uh, products exporting market in Indonesia as Bangladesh's strength in pharmaceutical area is uh, growing day by day. Bangladesh, uh, as uh, His Excellency 
agency must be knowing is the second largest online labor uh, producer worldwide. So Bangladesh has a tremendous strength that Indonesia can harness and Indonesia can invest. And in fact, today morning, I was looking at one article uh, uh, published in March uh, 2022 in the newspaper um, called uh, Indonesia Investment. Although we do not have direct access to all the uh, uh, throughout the article, it is a paid subscription uh, uh, program. But uh, as far as I could read, I can see how Indonesia is gearing up and locating Bangladesh as a sustainable uh, you know, country where uh, Indonesian investment can be uh, trusted with. So that is another strength area that Bangladesh is uh, uh, developing. And we can see that uh, uh, another area, uh, in interesting area where uh, Bangladesh and uh, Indonesia are working together is the area of defense cooperation. As His Excellency has mentioned, uh, not only at the area of even peacekeeping operations where uh, respectively Bangladesh uh, is now um, uh, the uh, top troops contributing countries and Indonesia is seven. So there are a number of cooperation in that areas. So this cooperation, as we can see, that this cooperation uh, can uh, increase and also uh, not only in terms of uh, even peacekeeping operations where uh, uh, defense, um, you know, purchasing of defense products that can help Bangladesh, uh, that we can purchase from Indonesia, that we can train our, uh, you know, uh, uh, armed forces with, but also there is, a, uh, uh, there is also a capacity building where Indonesia and Bangladesh can work together. Bangladesh has a uh, top ranking, um, you know, uh, world-class uh, um, uh, training uh, center, Bipsot, where uh, Indonesia can take advantage of, as, as um, um, His Excellency already has mentioned, Indonesian uh, members of armed forces come to NDC and Staff College, and I have had the opportunity of interacting with them by virtue of being a lecturer over there. Um, so not only that, there are also existing training programs between Air Forces of Indonesia and Bangladesh. Uh, and um, if I may pronounce it correctly, um, Indonesia and Bangladesh are uh, Bangladesh purchases um, Alut Sista, uh, which is composed of advanced weapon system, for example, patrol ships, aircraft for um, armed combat and transport that Bangladesh is purchasing from Indonesia. So in that area, there is a cooperation. Uh, not only that, um, uh, also in terms of Bangladesh and Indonesian Air Forces cooperation, Bangladesh is participating in a Komodo exercise with Indonesia from 2014. So there's a strong uh, defense cooperation between the two countries. And that is where we can see that um, uh, Bangladesh and uh, Indonesia can develop their uh, fund of, uh, their uh, defense relationship. The defense relationship between Bangladesh and Indonesia is not yet gone to a strategic level, but talks are there so that Bangladesh India defense cooperation can transform to a strategic uh, uh, defense cooperation area. As well, there are a number of areas where Bangladesh and India, uh, Bangladesh and Indonesia can potentially contribute with each other, as we can, as uh, His Excellency has mentioned, G2G level, but also there are potentials to cooperate uh, in uh, track 1.5 level of diplomacy and track 2 diplomacy, especially in the areas of public diplomacy, uh, where uh, there can be more cultural interaction, people to people contact, uh, there can be exchange of, um, you know, uh, students between the two countries, there can be um, uh, signing of MOU between um, Indonesian and Bangladeshi universities where there can be faculty exchange, there can be student exchange, there can be research exchange, there can be joint research in areas uh, that can interest both uh, Indonesia and Bangladesh. One other area that we need to understand, but that Bangladesh is a 26th member of ARF and uh, with cooperation with the ARF, Bangladesh and ARF have drawn up uh, uh, plans to uh, uh, tackle um, in the areas of disaster cooperation, how ARF and Bangladesh can work in this area uh, that has been going on since, uh, uh, to, uh, since uh, you know, 2007 onward. Not only that, there are a couple of other uh, areas where Bangladesh and Indonesia can fruitfully cooperate. For example, maritime search and rescue. This is an area because uh, in Indonesia is uh, uh, um, not directly in the in the Bay of Bengal community, but Indonesia can act as an uh, as an observer uh, of uh, beam stake. It can work as an observer in the Bay of Bengal community um, of uh, cooperation. So maritime search and rescue is one area where Indonesia and Bangladesh can successfully 
successfully cooperate. For Bangladesh, this is an area that, that is yet evolving. Bangladesh do not have an effective maintenance and search and rescue area. Uh, in, the, in the vicinity of uh, Bangladesh in the Indian Ocean region, only India and Singapore are the two uh, countries uh, where uh, which uh, conduct maintenance and search and rescue. So this is an area where Bangladesh and Indonesia can work together. Then there is a uh, maritime data cable security and cyber security area. This is another area uh, which is very important for uh, both Bangladesh and Indonesia where we can work together. And of course, as a uh, uh, we have uh, spoken that uh, given that, uh, you know, Bangladesh and Indonesia um, are working, both working as uh, emerging middle powers and middle power uh, respectively. So this is the area we can work on in the areas of sustainable uh, co-development uh, uh, area. And also as Bangladesh is looking forward to diversify its export destination, that is another area Indonesia can um, be a, a destination for Bangladesh. As uh, increasingly we can see non-cotton apparel items and techniques textiles are areas that Bangladesh is expertising on and Bangladesh is also promoting uh, is, is uh, you know BGME is working with Indonesia BGME is promoting uh, Bangladesh's you know uh, sort of um, Bangladesh stand as a as a uh, one of the textile and apparel uh, industries as a as a brand uh, uh, producer so that is one another area that can work as uh, his excellency has pointed out how trade between the two countries it has it has increased from um, as we can see from 1995 the trade has uh, you know uh, for till today there has been 11% uh, annualized uh, you know, growth in bangladesh indonesia trade so uh, bangladesh's dependence in many countries uh, in terms of its uh, trade destination uh, that can be diversified by looking at uh, southeast asian nations especially uh, uh, to indonesia as his excellency has mentioned that uh, uh, indonesia Indonesia was the first country with Muslim majority that uh, recognized Bangladesh. That is something Bangladesh has always remembered and Bangladesh uh, has been very grateful about because in 1972 onward, as Bangladesh uh, suffered from uh, uh, sort of uh, projecting its identity, uh, their Indonesia's involvement uh, in, in promoting Bangladesh has uh, 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 sort of worked in favor of Bangladesh's uh, uh, promotion of its identity uh, properly to the international community. So um, uh, we can see that uh, number of uh, commonalities and point of convergence that exist between Bangladesh and uh, Indonesia, how Bangladesh and Indonesia both are promoting themselves as you know, a, a neutral uh, country in terms of uh, pursuing its foreign policy uh, when a number of global crisis is going on. Uh, and as we can see that um, a number of uh, you know, foreign policy analysts are talking about the onset of a, of a, of a second, or if I may put it, that uh, 21st century. Uh, global Cold War, uh, both Bangladesh and Indonesia have uh, pledged uh, so that they remain in a, in a, and provide a neutral area because for Bangladesh and Indonesia, we can neither live uh, without uh, America nor can live without China. This is something we need to uh, recognize because of our geographic, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of connection because of geographic contiguity, as well as for our economic development and sustainable development. And Bangladesh is soon set to become, uh, you know, uh, uh, at, uh, within uh, as uh, 26th uh, large uh, you know trading nation in the world by by the year 2040 um, in fact in fact by the year uh, in in fact before that so here we find that uh, the bilateral strengthening of bilateral relations will work in favor of both the countries um, I finish uh, uh, now and I uh, sort of if there are any questions any areas I, I'll contribute uh, uh, furthermore thank you uh, thank you, Professor uh, Yasmin, for those uh, which I thought very well-structured uh, remarks uh, and broadly uh, three uh, uh, in three sets. Uh, you have firstly uh, analyzed how uh, the goals and objectives converged, uh, uh, I'd assume, uh, uh, influenced by the uh, commitment to uh, the original Bandung uh, principles, really. And secondly, you have traced the trends in, in foreign policy evolution for both countries. And also thirdly, identified the areas uh, in which the bilateral relations uh, can, can be addressed and how they can progress to the benefit of both countries. You've gone into uh, good details, I thought, how these sort of activities under the ARF would also be expanded. Uh, so good, I think. And uh, if there be any questions that are directly addressed at you, by any of the other uh, uh, discussions, I'm sure you'll be 
in a position to respond, and it's with great pleasure now I uh, I would invite uh, um, uh, 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 Ambassador Tarek Tareeb to uh, make his remarks. Uh, no need for any introductions. One of our most distinguished diplomats, uh, Ambassador Kareem. I will try and focus my own remarks to looking ahead. That's the, the, the second part of the uh, subject matter. Uh, because I think what exists today from where we came has been already dwelt upon in quite great details by both uh, Ambassador Hiro Subolo and by Professor Lailu Faryasmi. Uh, I, I have myself wrestled with this dilemma. Why Indonesia and Bangladesh remained close and yet estranged in a way. Indonesia, after all, is one of the three or four countries, I think Turkey and Malaysia and perhaps Afghanistan, where the three other, none of the Arabs had recognized us, who recognized, who accorded formal recognition to us immediately we had achieved independence in our liberation war in December 1971. We established relations, diplomatic relations only in 72. But I think uh, the symbolic importance is that these four countries of which Malaysia and Indonesia are right immediately next to us in our immediate Southeast Asian neighborhood, they were the first to come forward. Uh, Ambassador Subolo, you have rightly correctly pointed out that we are the fourth and eighth largest populous countries in the world. We are the first and fourth largest Muslim pop populated countries in the world. That gives us an inherent strength and resilience that we have not realized for ourselves. And if we worked, if we had worked harder at developing closer relationship with each other, I think the, the regional situation and geography would be very different. Uh, I have also, uh, I mean, this is the 25th anniversary of the foundation of a founding of BIMSTEC. And I had contributed an article at the request of the BIMSTEC Secretary General to looking ahead for BIMSTEC. And in a sense, BIMSTEC, the name is a misnomer. And I have always said so. BIMSTEC initially was only Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Thailand economic cooperation uh, from BISTEC to BIMSTEC. And then when Bhutan and Nepal joined it, I think the uh, organizers found it a little challenging to add two more consonants to the acronym, but very ingenuously, called it Bay of Bengal Multisectoral Technical Economic Cooperation. If we call it Bay of Bengal Cooperation, then the configuration is incomplete because the two most, uh, two very significant countries and economies and powers, middle powers in the Bay of Bengal, Malaysia and Indonesia are out of it. And I have been actively uh, 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 advocating that this we now read to re, re look at BIMSTEC as BIMSTEC Plus, and I would in fact say redefine the goals of BIMSTEC. We should actually come together to work towards establishing a Bay of Bengal economic cooperation uh, configuration. Uh, for me, it is very natural that we should be looking at that, not only because of we have, uh, in terms of the populations that we share, the, the size of the populations, the adherence to a common faith. The common faith we adhere to is also the faith which is one of moderation and inclusiveness. And in a world today where divisions are so, so very uh, uh, acrimonious, between people adhering to different versions, we together can play a, a sort of uh, uh, calming role in uh, diffusing or eliminating these divisions among us. Number two, if we look at this 
Bay of Bengal economic cooperation for configuration that I'm alluding to, we would just the seven plus three or four, because I see in this configuration, not just the Bay of Bengal literals, that Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. I see the countries of immediate, with immediate interest, landlocked countries like Bhutan and Nepal, the outlying ports which can, which have been or can become anthropos like Singapore and Maldives, and countries of Im immediate interest in the region like uh, Vietnam coming in and strengthening us. Together we would comprise, we already do without these countries of interest, a quarter of the current global population, nearly a quarter. If we were to join together with our GDPs uh, 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 being looked at together, we would be fourth grouping in the global scenario after the USA, China, and the European Union. And just imagine how the global relations, economic and otherwise, would be then reconfigured. Uh, Globalization so far has been a downward, uh, uh, you know, uh, has had a downward, it's, it's been a, a top-down process that has been imposed on many of the countries without the resilience or the capacity. The COVID pandemic that came and struck us, and I believe now there are other pandemics in the offing, which have just happened in Europe, and probably we should be braced for that spreading elsewhere because globalization has uh, made uh, geography and, and time, space and time more or less irrelevant. Uh, so we should be prepared for their spreading eastward to us. Uh, basically, we need to, to consolidate what we have between ourselves. And I agree totally with Ambassador Subolo that looking forward, we need to intensify our cooperation with each other. We need to rediscover each other more. Uh, why is it that since culturally we were so closely intertwined, we have been so distant proximities? Um, if we work together in this, it is to our benefit. We will develop not only national resilience in each of the countries that are here, we will develop a, a, a a regional resilience in facing the pressures that will be coming to us because the world today globally we are in a state of flux it's an inflection point the future of which is still uncertain and and what happens elsewhere will affect us uh, in, uh, nationally as well as where we are located and so we will be better positioned to tackle those unseen yet undetermined uh, threats that might emanate from there if we start collaborating and looking at this together, arrive at a point where we look at things together. I think our biggest, biggest point that we had together was that we were both the originators of the Bandung paradigm that came, emerged. And uh, now that paradigm known as non-alignment is not anymore a fashionable term among uh, in, in global politics, particularly because it is decried by several large powers. That should not deter us. I think as the world changes, we also need to re redefine that. And I've been saying non-alignment exists, but many people are wary of touching it because it affects the relationship with the larger powers. But both Indonesia and, and Bangladesh have together taken an approach of balancing the relations between all these different large powers on our, you know, around us. We are both between uh, more than one rock and several hard places. And that is why we have both adopted uh, uh, strategies and actions that say we are with everyone, but we are not against anyone. It is uh, what I would define, and I have, I have publicly stated, 
a position of positive neutrality. Neutrality itself is also appears to be hands off, but we will be engaged with everyone, but we will not take sides in disputes that we have with mutual friends. That is the only way we can survive. And if we can do it together, it will give out a very strong and clear message to everyone else. I mean, today, why is this focused attention on the Indo-Pacific, which was not there 10 years or 15 years ago? In a sense, I, I have recently said that we are placed at the epicenter of an oceanic planet. You know, imagine if Captain Kirk in his USS Enterprise comes from an outer galaxy looking for planets, he suddenly finds this planet, which is a blue planet, unlike all other planets that he has seen. It's 71% of this planet is oceanic, and all the oceans are somehow interconnected. And we happen to be situated right in the center of this oceanic world, both Indonesia and us. The Indian Ocean, which is known by Earth geographers as the Great Middle Bay, is the central ocean flanked by the Pacific on one side, the Atlantic on the other side, and the Antarctic on its south. Uh, we are the smallest of the four oceans, but we are the right at the epicenter of the, of the four oceans. Number two, we in the Bay of Bengal are at the epicenter of the Indian Ocean. And in that sense, I have even said, I've, I've, I've said it somewhat outrageously, that in that sense, Bangladesh is at the epicenter of this oceanic world, as we are with Indonesia. So in a sense, we have a strategic value to the rest of the world far greater than what we imagine ourselves. And we can only take advantage of this if we work closely together, Indonesia and us. If we can only uh, uh, build on this further and consolidate this advantage that we have, uh, because everyone's attention being devolved here for commercial reasons, for strategic reasons, for trying to jockey with each other in, in terms of projecting military power, we need to insulate ourselves from that jockey. We should be part of that process, but we need to make sure that it doesn't intrude into our own national and regional interests. And that is why I uh, would uh, reach out to you, Ambassador Subolo, that you as a member, as one of the uh, defining members of ASEAN, ASEAN would not have happened without the leadership provided by uh, your foreign minister, then foreign minister, Mr. Adam Malik. You were the largest entity in that grouping at that time. You were the most powerful militarily uh, at that time among the seven or, uh, nations or six nations which came together. Yet, you had the wisdom that being the largest, you stepped back. You stepped back and allowed them to grow. You stepped back and allowed them to feel comfortable being with such a large neighbor next door. I think one of the reasons uh, uh, SARC could not go forward is because the largest entity in, in the SARC composition did not take the wisdom of this approach that you had. Uh, it's beginning to do so now, but I think SARC today is not going to go anywhere because India and Pakistan, I don't think in my lifetime, I'm going to see some form of uh, resolution. However, I think we should understand from the lessons we have learned for the non-success of SARC to translating that to the regional relations that we in the eastern part of South Asia and Southeast Asia can put together. And in this, I think Indonesia and Bangladesh have a role, a significant role to play. If only they will realize that they have such a role if they will only, if they will understand that they have this role to play. And I, I therefore totally endorse the point you made, we must have greater people-to-people -people contacts. Not just in the terms of tourism, it has to be in terms of G2G exchanges and in public-private partnerships, developing between our two countries, synergizing between the respective strengths that each of us have. 
And once we start doing that, I think we will automatically discover that it is reconfiguring global relations in a manner that nobody has thought of yet. I think the last point I will say is that both of us, Bangladesh is no longer a least developed country. It's an emerging, uh, uh, you know, a developing partner. We are both graduating from what we were 20 years ago to what we should have been earlier, but we are gradually uh, uh, recognizing. Together, I think uh, uh, we, we are telling everyone that we were dependent on others, on the major powers, economic powers and, and military powers and uh, powers in other sense. We had a state of dependency. We are moving away from that state of dependency. We are trying to redefine our relationship uh, uh, as a state of interdependency. And when you, we have been able to successfully proclaim that we are interdependent, not dependent on anyone. It's only then that I think we will be able to consolidate the resilience internal and regional that we are seeking. And it's only then that we will be able to have uh, 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 a configuration where others cannot, cannot force us to take positions that are against our own natural tendencies and inclinations. And I will end with those remarks here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Karim. Excellent. Uh, you made very telling points. You have fo focused on uh, uh, the prognosis component of the deliberations today, uh, looking ahead. And in doing so, you have sought to uh, redefine the existing uh, uh, mechanisms, original mechanisms like Beamstack. And you'd rather have it uh, uh, as a Bay of Bengal economic cooperation configuration, which through its cooperation would be better able to develop the regional resilience, which you think uh, our two countries working together would be capable of producing. For instance, you, you've argued that while there is non-existence uh, in the ether, so to say, in the intellect, the, uh, the, the problem is uh, one is cherry of making it a frame of reference for fear of giving embrace to the key players. And yet, if we truly realize our potentials, we would be able to cooperate and, uh, uh, and uh, reach the desired aspirations and thereby make a contribution to the evolution of thought processes uh, uh, to, uh, to common, common good. Thank you so much. Uh, now I have a great pleasure in, in introducing Shayan Khan, Mr. Shayan Khan, and giving him the floor an extremely bright uh, uh, editor uh, of our uh, executive editor of the Data Courier. And uh, he has the responsibility of every week sort of bringing all the articles as a sort of a garland to uh, uh, together as a garland to produce the message that uh, the uh, journal delivers to its reading public. Cheyenne, you have the floor. 10 minutes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank the chair for his uh, well for his extra kind words just now. And uh, uh, otherwise, I would also like to thank Cosmos Trade and Outcome for uh, inviting me uh, onto this program. Uh, my greetings to my um, fellow discussants, uh, particularly His Excellency the Ambassador. Uh, his keynote has set the tone for the discussion already. And uh, I'm actually um, not going to. Um, torture you with my face for the entire 10, 10 minutes that I have. I, I will try and uh, um, let you feast your eyes on something else. Uh, I would just like to uh, reiterate something that Ambassador Karim has already touched upon, that uh, it is actually very surprising that uh, Indonesia and Bangladesh have not enjoyed greater engagement in their relationship uh, over the last 50 years, given the fact that uh, I mean, almost all the ingredients you would uh, think exist for us to be very natural allies, not just allies, uh, really close friends. And you would uh, imagine that there would be much more engagement uh, at, at the government level um, than there has been. And, uh, <clears throat> but these things will improve, we hope, uh, and um, particularly since uh, uh, 2018, uh, which was uh, when uh, uh, Indonesian President Joko Widodo uh, visited Bangladesh in, Jan in January of that year. Um, I think there have been um, uh, you know, there has been signs of some impetus into the relationship being 
um, uh, being infused. But uh, this was also uh, disturbed by the COVID pandemic, uh, which has uh, robbed us of two good years of engagement. But I think, uh, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> there have been signs recently that uh, things will be getting back on track. And uh, <clears throat> with that, I will just uh, try to share my screen now and get, uh, enter into um, this little thing that I have <coughs> uh, prepared for you. And uh, I hope this works out. Uh, Indonesia and Bangladesh, since 2018, have uh, shown signs of taking the, taking the, the job of uh, really uh, invigorating the relationship much more seriously. And this was, uh, I think, uh, a result of Joko Widodo's visit to Dhaka. <clears throat> also, he visited the Rohingya camps as well, of course, along with his wife. Uh, and uh, I think from the media's perspective, the reason I'm uh, focusing on the five interviews that were signed during that uh, uh, during that uh, visit, is the fact that from a media's perspective, from where I'm actually trying to present the public's perception of the relationship with Indonesia, I think um, the summit level meetings are really the, the occasions where uh, people get to actually uh, actually get to see the relationship as to how it is uh, uh, developing or what we are really looking forward to doing in, in the future. So I'm going to try and focus on these five MOUs and see uh, how much progress has been made or otherwise. So this is a picture of, uh, the, two, uh, of the two heads of government uh, on the day of the summit. Um, so five MOUs, what were they? Um, first one, the very first one was on foreign office consultation. Now this was actually, um, uh, I have very uh, eminent uh, diplomats uh, in the, in who are part of this discussion uh, that they would actually perhaps agree that just the, the mere fact that foreign office consultations had to be um, initiated between Bangladesh and Indonesia in 2018 uh, is a surprise in itself. So that, that was the first MOU that was signed that foreign office consultation would be started. The second was combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So this is something that's very important for both countries. We have very large fishing populations. Uh, and the last parts of the economy are uh, dependent on fishing. Um, the third is negotiations towards a, a, a preferential trade agreement. Now, when I'm going to discuss these things further, I'm going to try and bring in the, um, the trade aspect and economy uh, together under this under the discussion for this MOU. Uh, the fourth, uh, 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 and this was not an MOU actually, this was more a letter of intent, I think they call it. Uh, this was for a, a power plant, uh, but not a thermal power plant uh, later that. It could have been any power plant uh, between uh, Petro Bangla and uh, the Indonesian state hydrocarbon agency. And the fifth one, it was uh, also uh, along similar lines. This would be for LNG import for Bangladesh from Indonesia. So this was uh, foreseeing the fact that Bangladesh's gas reserves have been really dwindling and are going to do so uh, uh, in the days ahead. So uh, we're, I think we we're preparing uh, some um, foreign uh, providers of uh, you know, gas uh, substitutes. Um, so those are, the, those are the five. So the first one, the foreign office consultation, what did they actually happen? What, what, what happened as part of that agreement? I can happily report actually that uh, a bit more than three years later, in April 2021, the, the consultations did actually take place. Uh, it had to be done virtually because of the pandemic. And uh, this was a, a photo of the uh, discussion that was uh, released by, um, that was released by our uh, foreign ministry. Uh, the foreign secretary was chairing uh, from our end. Um, the Indonesians uh, also released uh, a photo. Um, they, they, they have it up on their Facebook page, the Indonesian embassy. Um, much ground was covered actually, when you uh, look through what, what was discussed uh, on that day, uh, I think there was much ground uh, that had built up over the years maybe. Um, so the, the first one was really basic versus fast track the MOUs that had already been signed uh, between the two heads of government. Um, similarly, there was, uh, to, uh, there was uh, this uh, discussion to boost uh, bilateral trade and uh, you know, get the signing of the PTA done. Um, Taka presented some of its uh, own um, desires for the relationship. It wanted duty free access for RMG, for its RMG industry. And uh, there was also um, uh, a request for market access to Indonesia's halal trade and investment uh, 
uh, economy, basically. So this was just uh, one of these uh, uh, things. There's, there was much more. Um, so it, in the most general sense, the, the, uh, the, the community, not the community, but rather the uh, release that was uh, given to the media from our foreign ministry, um, they had said that uh, the meeting discussed uh, on promoting cooperation on combating corruption, counterterrorism, science and technology, export promotion, defense cooperation, that uh, uh, one of the previous discussions had expanded upon. There's climate change adoption, uh, adaptation and mitigation as well. Uh, ethical migration, uh, parliamentary exchanges, okay, and uh, pursuing sustainable development goals. And uh, there was one very concrete game that actually uh, came out of the foreign office uh, consultations, or, or, or at least it was confirmed during the first foreign office consultation, which was that uh, uh, from then, general passport holders uh, of both countries can now visit each other's countries for free. So there's uh, the visa, I think, uh, visa, uh, visa fee has been waived for uh, each other's citizens. Now, the second one was, uh, if you remember, the uh, tackling IUV fishing, which is uh, illegal, unreported, and un uh, unregulated fishing. Uh, it's a, a big uh, problem for both countries. Um, IUV damages ecosystems and economy, this is set by the FAO, this image is from them. Uh, it is uh, harms uh, harms fish stocks and bycatch marine life, including active species. Uh, it is uh, compromising fishing management. There's certain uh, distrust and uh, uh, also undermining responsible fishes. Uh, there's much more actually. Uh, so IEU includes all fishing that breaks fisheries laws and regulations or occurs outside their reach. It is said uh, illegal uh, fishing usually means without a license in an area where fishing is banned. With prohibited gear over a quota or for uh, protected species. Uh, we know that even domestically, we have been trying very hard to protect our uh, richer species, for which we uh, impose pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, strictly observed bans these days. Uh, we're currently in the middle of one now, uh, of a 60 day ban of uh, fishing in the coastal areas. So that very often, it's a vessel entering a nation's waters with no fishing license or fishing with a license, but catching more than is allowed. So uh, they're the, the, uh, evading regulations, basically, uh, in order to increase their catch. Then there's the problem of unreported and underreported catches by licensed vessels looking to flood quarters or catch prohibited species. Uh, I just moved, uh, uh, they talked about the hillshires, uh, probably an example that we have in our domestic waters, but they're obviously in international waters, and there are many more uh, such species. Now, uh, though most of the world's fish are caught in the national waters of coastal states, uh, within 200 nautical miles of the shoreline, that is, a lot of unregulated fishing occurs beyond that on high seas, which cover almost 45% of our planet. And uh, I would think that uh, the, the IUU agreement that was signed between Indonesia and Bangladesh was actually uh, focusing on those areas. Patching reg regulation and enforcement in this vast area allow rampant IV. Um, and despite all this, given the nature of the problem, actually there are no reliable figures on illegal and uh, unreported or unregulated fishing. It is said that we see such a large range. The experts estimate that more than one in five, so that's 22 percent landed fish, is caught illegally. Um, with, this, uh, with the figure rising as high as one in four of Africa, uh, and uh, every year IUU is set to cost uh, the world economy between 26 to 50 billion dollars. Now that's a big figure, but it also illustrates, I think, um, how very little we know, given the fact that it's such a large rate they have to provide. And now uh, it was important for uh, Indonesia and Bangladesh to enter into such an agreement, because uh, there had been uh, uh, this reputation developing, whereby the way of being all coastal states uh, were said to have largely failed to comply with their duty to cooperate with other states, managing and conserving fishery resources in the Bay. And the obligation to cooperate is found in applicable international national instruments. And it's, a, it's believed to be customary in international law, basically, that we would abide by these things. But the failure of the red states uh, to effectively engage with other states uh, within the region in regulating marine fisheries have exacerbated the problem of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in the Bay, according to the ISSF, which is the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. I'm just going to go on to the next slide now. 
think that I talked about this thing. Oh, so uh, uh, one of the things that uh, during the FOC, um, the Foreign Secretary Masoud bin Norman also suggested was that, and this was, uh, the, though he said the two countries can expand, it was, it was taken to be um, the fact that it, Bangladesh could actually do with some technical help from Indonesia uh, in, in the form of expanding technical cooperation in not just extraction of marine, marine resources, but also deep sea fishing, fishing and uh, protection of coastal zones. <clears throat> right, so um, the, this is not the, actually the third one, it's actually the fourth one of the MOUs, but uh, bear with me here. This is a PT terminal BPW power plant, uh, the agreement for the power plant. Um, now, I, I think through the records, actually, this is still uh, not, it has still not been ditched, but also there has not been much progress in, in the scene. Um, uh, the Bangladesh has been so, sort of, uh, <clears throat> Um, not yet decided exactly if they want, do want to go ahead with this. It would, uh, given the fact that it's 1400 megawatts, it would uh, possibly be a coal, uh, coal fired power plant. Or what Indonesia has suggested, Petamina, uh, uh, what, what they have suggested is building a gas power plant with a capacity of 1400 megawatts that would consume about, that would consume about 150 to 200 million standard cubic feet per day. Of gas, which Petromina is expected to, they were expected to supply actually, but um, now the, the equation has changed slightly. Um, it's supposed to be in Anwara, and uh, uh, there was a, an initial date that it would start up in 2020, but it is not actually happening from um, the latest reports. Um, so, at the, as uh, there was this agreement that uh, Bangladesh would be looking to sign, uh, looking to um, uh, import uh, LNG from Indonesia as well, possibly, uh, this would actually work out very nicely if Pertamina were to build this plant in a, gla in a, uh, in a gas fired gas fire capacity, <coughs> which is why they suggested uh, the, the thing that was said last that, uh, that they would supply the uh, LNG for it. Now, and the follow-up to the summit agreement, uh, that was the, the, the one between uh, Joko Widodo and she, uh, our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, a letter of intent was also signed uh, that year, later that year in August, for Bangladesh to import as much as 17.5 million tons of LNG per year till 2025. So you can see why Petromina would actually uh, think that uh, <clears throat> this would be a good idea to make it a gas-fired power plant. Um, <clears throat> but it's... Uh, also, Bangladesh, has, as, as we know by now, the Bangladesh has been one of the countries that has really been picking up its LNG imports in the last two, three years. Uh, in 2020, it ranked 15 globally among the nations that have increased their LNG imports the most. And just the year before that, there were seven. And, tw and 2021 figures are not yet out, but I, I think they used to find that Bangladesh would rank very high there as well. Uh, but in the midst of all this, uh, unfortunately, in the, the imports have failed to materialize. There, no, there have been no imports. Um, this may be due to uh, Indonesia rethinking its own uh, fuel mix, I think. Yeah, I think the ambassador would uh, be the best place to uh, say that. But uh, they, there's been a lack of initiative from Bangladesh as well that we could see. They have been dragging their feet on, uh, on the decision of the power plant and also um, uh, on where to buy energy from, and, and uh, given the fact that these energy prices have really been soaring in recent months, so they have been like shopping around. <clears throat> so, um, and the last uh, thing. So this, so this, uh, this is the one uh, anyway, that I had left out earlier. The third one, the third one, which uh, dealt with the PTA. Uh, but also, I think it's a, a good chance to uh, focus on trade a bit. Um, the PTA, I think the ambassador has uh, expounded on what exactly is going on in the PTA and what needs to happen. And I think there's really not much more to add there. But <clears throat> uh, if you look at uh, the, the present state of bilateral trade between Indonesia and Bangladesh, it is, I think we all agree anyway that uh, it is below potential. Um, is, uh, it has not yet uh, touched $2 billion in any uh, fiscal uh, as yet. There was, uh, there was this uh, upward curve in the, around 2018-19 where it had risen to $1.7 billion. And, but then the pandemic hit and then it's back again. I think the last year or the, or the latest year for which 
figures are available, I gave it to be 1.33 billion. We can like slide back again. But, I, but as I said before, I think after the pandemic, we'll be picking up again. Um, apart from that, that has also slowed down uh, this plan between uh, Bangladesh businessmen and Indonesian businessmen to actually increase that. They had some targets between themselves, but the IBCCI, which is the Chamber of uh, Commerce uh, for Indonesia and Bangladesh, <clears throat> when they had met, they had some target of uh, increasing uh, the bilateral trade fivefold by 2029, which would make us touch close to the $10 million mark. And if that could be done, that would be, I think, um, the most ideal thing to happen, basically. But uh, right now, the trade is very uh, minuscule. It's uh, below $2 billion, and it is really dominated by Indonesia and Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh's exports to Indonesia are really uh, negligible. It's for the entire uh, <clears throat> for the entire uh, trade figure is 1.69 billion uh, in favor of uh, Indonesia and uh, 75 million dollars only that Bangladesh is earning from exporting to Indonesia. So you can see why uh, um, during the foreign office consultations, uh, the foreign secretary had been pushing for um, perhaps greater access to the RNG markets and other um, <clears throat> Indonesian markets as well. This is dominated by uh, palm oil. I mean, all other uh, goods here are really quite negligible. I mean, uh, if you see there, 41% for of the entire trade figure is taken up by palm oil. And, uh, and this is, uh, on the right, you see the Bangladeshi export, but the entire Bangladeshi export is such a negligible figure of $75 million that, I mean, it's really no, uh, it's nothing to look at almost. <clears throat> but uh, palm oil, I think, uh, it, it, it's very important because uh, we have just heard the news, the good, very good news, again, that Indonesia has lifted the ban that it had imposed, the temporary ban that it had imposed a few weeks ago uh, on exports. So uh, this will uh, likely be going up even further in the days ahead. Um, this is a, an interesting chart that shows the competitive advantage in trade. So if, given the fact that Indonesia has palm oil and uh, other uh, products that we um, uh, just put the list of products here. So uh, in this comparison between trade between Indonesia and Bangladesh, what we have is uh, on, on the uh, horizontal axis, we have exports from Indonesia to Bangladesh, where you see that uh, things like uh, palm oil and, and their natural food uh, extracts are way on the right. Uh, and uh, Things that they don't enjoy comparative advantage, the things that Bangladesh enjoy comparative advantage, in, these are uh, on the top left. So, what could be these products? Um, these are based on 2020 figures. Um, Bangladesh had a large net trade uh, surplus with Indonesia in exports of textiles, this is very narrowly defined, foodstuffs, they say, and uh, chemical products. So, that even though they, there was this uh, comparative advantage that they enjoyed in these three uh, items, it will. It, it was very, very low. The, the numbers are very negligible. It's, it's something like one, for chemical products is 1.7 million, foodstuffs is 2.3 million, and textiles is a bit higher at 67 million. That's pretty much uh, the entire export figure of 75 million for Bangladesh. <clears throat> and Indonesia enjoyed huge uh, surpluses in uh, uh, just three products really. It's uh, <clears throat> animal and vegetable, vegetable byproducts under which palm oil obviously is categorized. You have the $714 million uh, dollar, uh, <clears throat> surplus in that. Mineral products as well, we know that uh, they're a very mineral-rich country uh, in Indonesia, and there they, they enjoy $423 million uh, surplus. And even uh, <clears throat> in other forms of textiles, which are not uh, specified here, but uh, even in, there are forms of, uh, this, these are probably high-end textiles. They also have an advantage in that. So overall, I think Bangladesh uh, um, would like to uh, would like some greater access and also would like to enter the Indonesian market in a much more uh, concerted way in the days ahead. And if this can be facilitated by the PTA, maybe um, once uh, we get a PTA, we can graduate to an FTA. Um, uh, in that way, if the economy develops, I think um, the relationship will be in good hands. And that's the best way to probably uh, ensure the uh, health of the relationship in the future. Uh, with that, I'll just uh, uh, ease off for now and listen to the ambassador's uh, plenary remarks and 
If anything is required, I'll, I'll come back. I'm sorry for you, sir. Thank you, Shayan. <laughs> that is very good. I mean, you uh, focused on the uh, five uh, MOUs, the Foreign Office Consultations Combating Unregulated Fishing, Negotiating Towards the PTA, not necessarily in this order, the thermal power plant, and LNG imports into Bangladesh. Uh, you've gone into some details. Um, you have uh, uh, reached the conclusion that uh, uh, that uh, the potentials in terms of our bilateral relations have not been tapped to the fullest, though you use this uh, thesis as actually a hypothesis of the uh, uh, when you initiated your, your discussions. Very true. I mean, the kind of... Uh, thing that you did just now, uh, I am absolutely certain that the FOC would have, uh, uh, unless it does so already, should have a, a, a mechanism to do just what you did. I mean, sort of uh, a monitoring mechanism uh, under the broad umbrella of the FOC to, uh, to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, study the progress of uh, the uh, uh, MOUs and also troubleshoot troubleshoot in the way that you know, if you have run into problems in the Pertamina uh, uh, and, and uh, the PWD, PWD uh, uh, project on the thermal power plant, what can be done to resolve the impediments uh, that, that we confront and sort of develop these ideas further, like uh, develop the PTA into an FTA. In any case, uh, as we evolve, we need further calibrations and this mechanism this mechanism under the broad umbrella of the FOC would perhaps uh, do just that. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that intervention. Ambassador, now the ball is back in your court uh, to react to some of the excellent suggestions that have emanated from uh, the observations of our, uh, of our discussions. And thereafter, we will wrap up. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, of course, there will be a discussion based on what what you've said, if others need to react to uh, to your remarks now, they would have probably time to do so. Ambassador. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iftekar, and also the distinguished panelists who already presented uh, valuable input and views on how Indonesia and Bangladesh can move forward in a better and comprehensive relations. Uh, there are so many things that we uh, can discuss on this matter. And let me uh, start with the uh, uh, foreign policies issue first, in which Indonesia and Bangladesh share uh, valuable uh, uh, views on different kind of uh, regional and international for us. And as Indonesia's foreign policies uh, itself, which is free and active set out in 1945 constitutions, is always focused not only on the priority of national development and also the preserve internal and national as well as regional stability. But of course, uh, this is also respecting the neighbors, the uh, uh, concerted effort uh, of the neighbors in preserving the peaceful and resilient regions. And as you know that Indonesia is also the capital city of ASEAN and the founding uh, fathers, uh, one of the five founding fathers of ASEAN. So this is also the stepping stone of our uh, foreign policies in tackling issues in the regions. And as you know that the uh, uh, ASEAN, uh, which uh, Indo-Pacific uh, or ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, which already been discussed in different kind of fora, uh, can also be considered as a reference on how the uh, Indonesia and especially in the region, uh, stable region in ASEAN would go forward, embracing neighbors uh, in a peaceful and mutual uh, recognition one. So this is something that we can uh, highlight more in a constructive dialogue and discussion, uh, including the Bay of Bengal uh, that has been mentioned by uh, Ambassador Tariq Karim, which is very relevant on today's uh, discussion in which how to connect both regions, uh, each other and mutual in a uh, constructive way. 
I think uh, the reinvigorating of uh, Indonesia and Bangladesh partnership uh, has also offers the positive and also constructive solution to various challenges in which the ASEAN centrality is the one that we view the Indo-Pacific. So uh, if uh, panelists uh, have read uh, in, in a recent publication and views that the importance of the ASEAN outlook of Indo-Pacific, which could help foster regional stability is underway. And it is the uh, something that we are very praised on uh, the current uh, development. Under the framework, uh, Bangladesh uh, can also, my view, uh, to strengthen cooperation uh, in the region through trade, for example. Because AOIP, ASEAN Outlook of Indo-Pacific Implementation, is mostly through the ASEAN plus one mechanism. So ASEAN and its partners has discussed extensively on the aspect of uh, Indo-Pacific connectivity and how the such connection can be synergized through the ASEAN master plan of ASEAN connectivity, which include extended into the regional uh, surrounding. Uh, the other uh, issue that also been touched uh, by uh, Mr. Sayan Khan on, on the uh, sea and also Mr. Uh, Ambassador Tariq uh, Karim, it is very uh, timely. If we take up the Indo-Pacific concept, for example, uh, it's more a seascape perspective. Uh, we are talking uh, about the Indian Ocean. We are talking about the Oceania. And in some point, can also be extended through Bay of Bengal, in which Indonesia in one hand and Bangladesh in the other hand can play a significant role. I also would like also to underline the, the biggest potential that need to be tapped between the two countries, Indonesia and Bangladesh. Sure that the uh, Indonesia and Bangladesh has a huge potential, huge skill collaborations and huge ad advantages that need to be explored more by both sides. Let's take a look and trade, for example. In trade, there is no loss, but uh, loss and win, but win-win connection. I know that trade is below potential because in some way our transaction is not direct. The transaction of trade mostly uh, is through the third countries. So if we calculate the uh, amount and the value of the trade, sometimes we lost the value that left in the third countries because we need some direct connection. Uh, the connection of trade uh, also uh, uh, through the third countries uh, basis. Secondly, for example, we need to explore product potential of both countries. So that's, uh, I invite the Bangladesh trade delegation to explore into the Indonesian market and also to coll collaborate with the Indonesian businessmen entrepreneurs through different kind of fora. We have a, a very a biggest, uh, you know, gathering of uh, a trade uh, and investment related, for example, in uh, TTI, Trade uh, a Tourism Expo of Indonesia, which this year will uh, uh, be conducted uh, on 19th to 23rd of October. So I think this is a, a platform that we also can uh, explore together. The other uh, views that I think uh, we can elaborate together and discuss more is uh, what we call the powerhouse concept. What is powerhouse concept? A powerhouse concept between Bangladesh and Indonesia is something that we can tap from each other potential use it and what do you call digest it together, explore it together, can, uh, and the outcome of the uh, collaboration can be used for each markets or can be sent out to third country basis. Bangladesh is very strategic location in South Asia. It can be a, a, you know, a central location for uh, 
you know, uh, entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, to the South Asia market. And vice versa, ASEAN, especially Indonesia, can be your, uh, uh, you know, uh, entry point to a more prospective Southeast Asian market. For example, in textile, I know that the Bangladesh has very huge and great ready-made garments. As well, Indonesia has also have, uh, like for example, synthetic substance to be uh, used for textile. So can collaborate, work together, yeah, creating a new textile industry, modern one, new product that can be used both in market in Indonesia and Bangladesh, but also can also be exported to third country basis using your very established connection with the world. For rare earth substance, like for example, uh, you know, uh, different kind of uh, material for high sophisticated industry, for example, for electric vehicles that we have, for example. It can be also tapped by Bangladesh uh, think tank and Bangladesh uh, sophisticated engineers uh, can be digested into a factories or something which really can be used for the future industry, especially related with the uh, electric and electrification of different kinds of uh, household and transportation. Food, for example, you have a different kind of fruit, different kind of agricultural product, then we can use together with the Indonesian industry uh, and make a new different kind of product that we can sell in both market, Indonesia and Bangladesh, but also for ASEAN market, for example, that can benefit from the industry. For the uh, textile or, murder, uh, or, or uh, what we call it the uh, ready-made garments. Uh, combination of Punjabi and sari with the design batik, for example, for both market is very inviting and very prospective. Couple months ago, I met with uh, your uh, previous ambassador of Indonesia, which I happened to met here in, in Dhaka. She is using a sari, with, uh, uh, with the batik's embroideries from the Iwan Tirta uh, design that really uh, very nice. It can be used both in Bangladesh and also sell the product to Indonesia. This is very uh, interesting uh, combination using the powerhouse concept that really uh, uh, create something new for both market and for uh, third market inviting Bangladesh private sector to invest in different kind of uh, uh, food product in Indonesia, including palm oil and, and other food, halal, halal food and halal industry. This is also something that we can elaborate together. The other uh, collaboration that we uh, really uh, strengthen our relation is also using soft uh, uh, diplomacy. Uh, as I mentioned, people-to-people -people, uh, connection is very important. And one of them we can use, for example, in sports, in sport activities that we can collaborate in fighting uh, two other teams for uh, Bangladesh and Indonesia. Uh, last time I saw the disabled football team from Indonesia came here in, in, in Dhaka to play uh, for the uh, friendship competition. And maybe someday the cricket team uh, of Bangladesh can be played in Indonesia with the Indonesian team, creating a friendship relations, as well as our badminton team from Indonesia can also be introduced more in a different kind of activities of badminton in Bangladesh, for example. It will create more connection between people. And as uh, mentioned and, uh, and presented by Mr. Sayan Khan, my job will be much easier in, in Bangladesh. Why? Because our close relations between our leaders, President Jokowi and Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been met in different kinds of occasion and also provide mutual respect and different collaboration 
in any forest. But my job is also easier because you're friendly people, hospitable people of Bangladesh. It also create some different opportunities in making our bilateral relation getting stronger and stronger. So I stop my comment and looking forward for more engagement and collaboration because we are certainly two big nation with a lot of abundant of advantages and skills that can be explored and tap for benefit of our good relation. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Ambassador. I mean, this is uh, not just uh, uh, summing up or anything like that, but you've also brought in uh, new elements and given further, uh, invigorated the discussions even further. Alas, however, we're running out of time a bit. Uh, so if there be any uh, comments that, uh, that you wish to make at this point in time, uh, before I hand over the floor to uh, uh, Nahar, uh, you could do it but uh, be very, very brief in what you say. So is there um, uh, anyone who would like to say something as a, as a sort of an absolute concluding one minute remark? I think what I'd like to say is that, you know, uh, we took a long time to actually engage in institutionalized dialogue. We took much too long a time considering the history from where we started a relationship. Uh, it was, I think, only the second in the series of interministerial consultations and the first in the series of uh, higher level consultations. We need to really step that up. And I think, uh, Ambassador Hiro, you have uh, uh, a role to play. There is a good team in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who are, who are receptive to this idea. I've been talking with them. Uh, we need to make sure that we meet often, we meet well prepared, and we are forward looking in what we are doing. And once this is set, this becomes a regular exercise once at least once a year, I would say twice a year if necessary. Uh, we will see because relations do not grow uh, amorphously. Relations have to grow with clear directions from the political leadership that yes, we have a shared vision, this is where we go, uh, need to go. And I think that we have identified today many areas we, where we think similarly. I think the challenge is drawing synergy from each other and making those come to meet together. So I'll, I'll, I'll just add that. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, 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 Prof Professor Yasmin. Dr. Yasmin, anything to say? Very quickly, one minute. Um, uh, I, I would say that uh, the kind of uh, directions that uh, we have received from uh, His Excellency at the uh, end of the discussion, this is something that we can work on, that uh, what are the ways that Bangladesh can um, uh, sort of uh, bridge the, the gap that existed so far in, in bilateral relations. And as Ambassador Tariq Karim has pointed out, that uh, it took uh, quite some time to, for the relationship to grow. Um, and there are a number of reasons behind that, of course, uh, because Bangladesh was struggling with politics of recognition and very rightly pointed out that it is the non-Arab countries which recognize Bangladesh at the beginning. Uh, so these, uh, these uh, are the uh, issues and factors that we need to recognize. And we also need to recognize how in the context of the, the Indo-Pacific, the Bay of Bengal, um, and uh, in terms of uh, you know, strategic relations, uh, in terms of defense cooperation, how Bangladesh and Indonesia can further their bilateral relations. Uh, and of course, uh, the soft power diplomacy is something that cannot be neglected in today's world. So how we can connect with each other other um, at the at the people to people level societal level we get to know each other uh, we already know and his excellency is aware how you know uh, bali is one of the key destination for bangladeshi tourists so how we can promote here cox's bazaar um, and how we can learn from each other in in this kind of promotion 
and also how we can promote each other in each other's media you know how we see about how we view bangladesh uh, you know uh, how you view bangladesh you can promote that in indonesian media how we see indonesia how to promote that in bangladeshi media there can be concerted effort there can be institutional effort in this regard that can be promoted by by the uh, by the embassy and uh, we can we can all work together in this regard thank you thank you uh, thank you uh... Mr. Shayan Khan, Shayan, are you now satisfied that our deliberations have taken us one step forward towards fulfill fulfillment of the fruition of our relation, uh, untapped uh, 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 exploitation of our relationship? Absolutely, Absolutely. I believe uh, that uh, the better days are ahead, ahead it's inevitable. And just to be up on something that uh, uh, Professor Lala picked up on, uh, there is actually on the website, in the Indonesian Embassy's website, uh, a mixture of Bahasa and Bangla that they that they are actually teaching. Which is extremely interesting. That uh, given that you said that we uh, promote ourselves in each other's media. Other than that, I think uh, uh, better days are ahead, as I said, and I love Batik too. I would like just like to let them pass it now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, I recognize Mr. Nathanla Khan on the screen. Uh, yes. Would would he want to say something? Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. I, I, thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm in Singapore. I just arrived day yeah. before yesterday night, and uh, uh, but I really wanted to listen, and I have listened from uh, from the beginning to the end, and oh. I think it went beyond my expectation, uh, and I think each and every discussant, and especially our keynote speaker. Ambassador has spoken very well. I just want you to add some of my personal uh, observation that uh, that I think it has been already told. But what I would like to re-emphasize is that Bangladesh, Indonesia ties have been totally underexplored, underexploited, and I sincerely hope with the uh, arrival of the new uh, Indonesian ambassador, we can definitely. Uh, uh, you know, look at those opportunities, and uh, and and I think uh, what each and every discussant has said, uh, this will definitely come out, and it will be in the social media. But uh, but I think I feel very encouraged because Bangladesh and Indonesia, uh, have, our ties are based on trust, which is a fundamental thing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, between uh, building a relationship between two countries, so that trust we have. 50% of the problem or challenge is already there. But the rest 50% is the initiative that we need to take from each side. I think there could be more exchange of students. There could be more uh, sort of uh, cooperation in green and, and kind of uh, digital uh, economies. Uh, because I see so many new Indonesian, you know, uh, the digital companies are coming up and I watch them from Singapore. But Bangladesh can definitely take advantage of it, and and I, I'm sure our relations uh, will grow from uh, from strength to strength. And I, I will stop here. But I once again I thank everybody uh, uh, for their very very valuable contribution. Ambassador yeah. Tariq Kirimbhai, Nilufar Yasmin, and uh, Ambassador Hiro Subolo, my good friend, uh, uh, Shayan Khan, and I think Shayan, you should be present in each and every. Future Ambassador Lecture Series. Ambassador Tariq Karim Bhai, you, you have uh, given a wonderful angle, a very refreshing angle, this Indo-Pacific region and the Bay of Bengal, how Bangladesh can take advantage of our geographical location. And I think we have overlooked uh, and we have underestimated our strength. We, it's time for us to assert and, and to act. Uh, and, and lastly, I would like to thank Nahar uh, 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 for for uh, uh, you know uh, um, 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 making this happen, and now uh, over to Nahar. I, I just conclude this uh, discussions, the deliberations. The thing, I mean, excellent deliberations, of course. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, just to make the point that uh, as we evolve our bilateral relations, and you have your work uh, cu cut out, uh, Ambassador Sabolo, but uh, also bear in mind that there is evolution of another set of relationships in the region which are security focused. And uh, Indonesia has shown the way how we can steer clear 
of involvement in those uh, disputes, big power disputes, and develop our bilateral relations in a way that it benefits our nations and peoples. So with these, thank you uh, everyone so much, and Nahar, over to you. Thank you all for such an insightful and stimulating discussion on Bangladesh-Indonesia relations that surely merits more attention from policymakers. It is our hope that today's session can play its part to set the ball rolling in a forward direction in the coming days. On behalf of the Cosmos Foundation, I would like to express our profound appreciation to Ambassador Sabolo for his brilliant participation. Our distinguished panel of discussants along with Mr. Anayatullah Khan are also owed a special thanks for sharing their thoughts with us, which has been a key factor in the round table's success. Last but not least, I must thank our distinguished chair, Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Choudhury, for steering the discussion with skill and stewardship as always. In conclusion, may we join our hands in applauding this very successful event today. Wishing you all good help and all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay Thank healthy. You.